Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Rick Valenta, who will be giving us an update on via variability and flexibility. Thank you, Rick. Okay, so this is a uh, one of the uh, um, one of the, the initiatives I mentioned this morning was was something that we called variability and flexibility, and I'm going to go over. I'll try and do it quickly. I'm going to go over a little bit of ground that uh, that I've already covered um, in that respect because uh, I sort of briefly touched on this before. Um, but you know, the the question is, are we going to run out of the commodities we need? Um, and and I think what I showed, for example, for copper, there is a, uh, and this is from a recent paper, just looking at different different sources of demand for copper and and demand running out to 2100, and it's this is one of the five scenarios these people um, considered, and this is like the kind of middle of the road scenario, if you like, showing that that uh, from here copper demand is projected to increase by a very large amount because of some of the things I mentioned this morning around population growth and, and um, economic development, um, trying to meet the sustainable development goals, et cetera. And then I've already shown this El Shkaki, um diagram and a couple of other people have as well, just showing the, the our current situation um, with respect to recycling. So we're not gonna be able to, to um, Meet um, meet our demand through recycling. This is another one that I've shown previously. I didn't show show this morning, but it's another diagram put together by Richard Shawdy from Minex Consulting, just looking at the cost per ton of copper ore from 1900 to 2010, um, showing the, the and and highlighting some of the the um, the innovations that we've been able to apply in order to drive the cost per ton. Uh, down uh, for for copper production, and we've continued to do that. And to me, what's slowly come over the last few years is the realization that, as a group of people, as a bunch of geologists and engineers mainly, and and uh, um, in in our industry, we're really good at coming up with machines, widgets, workflows to actually deal with low grades. And we've done we've done a fantastic job of dealing with low grades. Um, and and so can we just you know the question some of the fundamental questions we were trying to answer early on in this process. What's happening? Oh, there I am. I couldn't see myself in the in the uh, uh, in the, in this process was was uh, uh, you know well how much how much is that technological development alone going to make in terms of a difference? And uh, and I think a lot of the work we've done so far has shown not much, but but. When you when you actually look at historical um, copper production by year and combine it with those projections and historical copper, so that's shown the blue bars and then the yellow line there is grade. So you can see the grade on the right hand side. And I think we're all pretty familiar with with various diagrams of this nature uh, that have been put together. Um, and when you take the decreasing grade and the increasing production and combine them together, turn that into tailings, you get an exponential curve like the one we've got on the right there going out to 2040. Um, and so I think I mentioned this last year, from 2040 to 20, 2045, we're going to end up producing the same tonnage of copper tailings as we did in the entire 20th century, um, which is kind of scary. But it also leads to the question, are we reaching the end of economies of scale? Because that's how a lot of that innovation has been driven. It's because it, when it was $160 a ton to produce copper ore, it's because there was somebody with a pick and a, and a, and, and, you know, a stick of dynamite in their back pocket um, working a very small mine, um, not a mine that's producing 40 million tons per, or mining 40 million tons per year, or an, you know, incredib an incredibly large, um, um, you know, operation. So what's the alternative? And to me, the, the simple alternative, and actually when I, when I first got involved in the complex oil bodies program, um, I asked a few people, well, you know, well, what can we do instead of economies of scale? And, and, and this was people from uh, what was then, um, you know, I, I think I remember talking to Grant Ballantyne and Malcolm Powell and those sorts of people and said, well, that's easy, it's flexibility. All we have to do is develop flexible processing that that um, that um, is able to understand and deal with variability in the rock. So so if we can 
if we can document cheaply at high resolution the variability in the rock and then develop the means to track that variability through the mining and processing stream, um, and then we develop flexible processing, then, then we're not forced to homogenize everything into this large bulk tonnage operation that ends up producing uh, billions of tons of, of tailings. So that seems pretty simple. Um, and the, some of the BRC people are gonna recognize some slides I've stolen from them. Um, so we've been working on developing, on, on understanding variability. Um, and, and this is a, whoa, this is a summary diagram that's been produced on that, on that front. So, so, you know, we're working actively and, and complex oral bodies to some extent or another has supported efforts to get better and better at trying to understand variability at a finer and finer scale that could then be incorporated into processing. Um, because the problem as it stands now is, and this is a Rocio diagram, which I've always, I really like this one. The yellow, the, the yellow things are metallurgical samples. They're bulked up, they're composited. There's very few of them. Um, and, and we're trying to infer processing behavior on, on not enough samples. Uh, but if we can actually predict the response in all those geological samples, we're in a better situation. The problem is it's expensive and prediction is not the easiest thing to do. Um, but, but there's also work going on. I think that's, you know, I've only re recently realized how exciting it is that, that, that will allow us to develop other methodologies and use other machines that will deal with some of the problems that we have in the area of, uh, in the area of characterization of, of variability in the area of, of some of the problems around metallurgical testing. And that is that, um, we're developing tools that will allow us to develop device independent predictions of, of hardness because a lot of the tests that we have now are device dependent um, and and tests that will use 500 grams of material as opposed to 50 kilograms of material 15 meter composites of, of, of drill core that we just say is all the same um, and that can be done more quickly and, and more cheaply so so this is an important part of the of the variability side of things, and then we're also developing. And this is through also through most and the IHAS group um, proposals for a, a flexi lab that will allow us to test flexible processing at a lab scale. So so to actually to to test some of the ideas we have about characterizing variability, feeding that in, and 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 having a a lab that can be virtually remotely controlled to respond to the variability that you've documented and propagated through the processing stream. Sounds easy, doesn't it? No, it's no, no problem. We'll finish it tomorrow. Um, but the other, there's another couple of parts of this, uh, and that is around uh, some of the things that we need to do to propagate, to take that variability and connect it to the flexibility. And one of those things that we've been working on that I wanted to mention was the whole remote working thing. Um, where um, this is an example, I've kind of mocked this up really, that that never really happened, but let's assume it did, um, where, where we had people in Brisbane working with people in Mount Isa who were, uh, and this, it, it did happen, but it just wasn't as, as, as um, simple as this, um, you know, remotely, remotely guiding a, a, a site-based survey. Um, and in addition to that, we're developing tools in the area of, of uh, visualization and control, um, which will help to connect that that the variability piece to the to the processing piece. So we have our hologram table facility. This is also marked up, but we're, we're working on putting all of putting a lot of our machinery um, into us into a form where it can be visualized in that hologram table and and online and using more augmented reality because that's what's going to be necessary. In order to incorporate that that variability into uh, into actual flexible mining and, and processing, but you know some of the challenges around that are that, that this whole thing is really quite dependent on on uh, um, you know once you start getting into detailed visualization and real time tracking of things, it's very dependent on host computer specifications and permissions, and if you're dealing with models and sending them around and then, then um, it, it becomes logistically very, very difficult. And what we've been, we've been working with a group called Euclidean, who have a, who have a package called UDStream that, that, 
that will allow you to visualize a lot of this um, more complicated, massive data sets in, uh, in three dimensions. <laughs> I'm getting scared now. <laughs> the storm is coming. Uh, I feel like I've angered the gods. Uh, so this is the lighthearted part of the afternoon because all I'm gonna do now is just show you, uh, I'm gonna hopefully show you an example of, of, of what we've been doing with, with UD Stream at a, um, at a regional scale. So, so this is basically, um, it's a program that, that allows you to, we, we, have, we have various programs that can load up three-dimensional data mm -hmm. and, uh, and visualize them in, uh, in various different ways. Um, but one of the limitations is that with most of the geo geoscience programs, by the time you've loaded up, um, you know, in our case, we've, we've compiled about 21 different three-dimensional atlases for the Mount Isa region. By the time you've, by the time you've loaded up one or two of them, um, your computer has been brought to its knees. And furthermore, you have to make them available to someone to download to run specialist software. Um, so this is happening just the way it didn't happen before, which is online. So um, all this all this data is being accessed on online rather than being run from your computer. So, for example, what we're looking at now is all of the regional seismic interpretations from the from the Mount Isa area, um, and and you can see there's quite a lot of them. This is actually the seismic interpretation over the Century Deposit, which is one of the one of the sort of giant um, deposits, one of the giant. Uh, lead zinc silver deposits from from the Mount Isa region, um, but the 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 thing that we can do with this visualization program is to load is to load data all the way from from this regional scale from the scale that goes all the way from the surface down to the you know down to the base of the crust all the way down to um, and I think we'll get to it in a second to high resolution photos of drill core and even uh, MLA data. Um, and we can do that for multiple, um, you know, for multiple um, um, deposits at once. Um, this system can load up to hundreds of terabytes of data um, and has a, has a means of accessing it in, a, in an efficient way. And hopefully, yeah, now that's what we just added there is the, is the recently completed exploring for the future airborne EM data. Um, let me see. I wonder if I can advance this up to, yeah, so I'm going to advance this to some, yeah, there's, so, so now we're, we're zooming into, to actual drill core in the same, in the same, uh, in the same system. And, and it looks a bit, it looks a bit chunky in there, but it's actually, it, it's stored in, in very high resolution. So, um, it's a system that we're working on for, for visualization of, of high resolution data all the way from crustal scale to, um, to, um, um, uh, you know, to, to micro scale. But the, the main, the main point here is that this is a, this is an ongoing effort that's pulling in a lot of different projects. And the whole aim, you know, as I said before, is to try to develop simultaneously the, to, to develop this idea that we can, or test the hypothesis that we can document variability at a scale that will allow us to carry out flexible processing as uh, as a substitute for the um, the the current approach of economies of scale, which is just going to run us into unbelievable trouble from a from a tailings and waste point of view. That's it. Thanks.